American businesswoman Marilyn Houston once said, the Internet of Things is the bridge between the virtual and the physical world, connecting the digital and analog realms. But that bridge is only as good as the connectivity bricks it's made out of, right? If that connectivity isn't reliable, what do we have? A broken bridge. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Wireless connectivity is one of the most important aspects of any IoT design. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Brandon Oaks from California Eastern Laboratories, or CEL, joins me to discuss the best practices for achieving reliable wireless connectivity for IoT. We examine the challenges of IoT wireless connectivity, the factors engineers should keep in mind when choosing a wireless solution, and how you can utilize CEL wireless connectivity technologies in your next design. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from CEL. Hi, Brandon. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Okay, so we're here today with California Eastern Laboratories to discuss one of the most important aspects of IoT, which is reliable wireless connectivity. Brandon Oaks, Director of Product Management, is joining us today to provide a better understanding of the issues surrounding this topic and to discuss the steps we need to take to help companies achieve reliable wireless. Yes, thank you. So as you point out, the wireless connectivity is one of the most important aspects of IoT. Without reliable wireless connections, there is no thing connected, and there's plenty of potential issues. So we can look at a couple of examples. Excellent. So let's look at those examples. But Brandon, before we get started, wireless connectivity isn't easy, right? What kind of challenges are you seeing in this space? You're exactly right. There's plenty of real-world examples that the wireless connectivity is not easy. What we see here are a couple of examples of products where the wireless connectivity either wasn't reliable, wasn't consistent, or was very difficult to set up and get working in the first place. Could have been a hardware problem, could be an antenna problem, could even be a software problem. But regardless, it's a problem with the product. The impact of these companies is huge. It damages their brand names. They have return products, lost sales, support calls, things that are very expensive. So, Brandon, what kind of ramifications can poor wireless connectivity have on a design? So, here's a few more examples where wireless connectivity was a contributing factor to products that essentially didn't succeed in the marketplace. One of the biggest ones that people don't think about is your operating expense. So, when customers have to call support lines and work on getting products connected, getting them to work, uh, it frustrates the consumer and it costs the company money. The reality is no one can guarantee 100% wireless connectivity, and we don't do that here at CEL either. However, there's plenty of things that we can do to try to minimize those issues and give customers the best wireless experience uh, when using our products. Excellent. Now, tell me more about CEL. You guys have been in the wireless space for a long time, right? Absolutely. We've been in the wireless space long before IoT existed. We're closing in on over 64 years of working in the RF and wireless space. Our focus today is on local area network wireless solutions. So things like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Zigbee, and some other protocols. The products that we have today have been designed to deliver maximum performance to give customers the best results in their products and in their customers' hands. We have support teams that help customers through issues with RF design, hardware design, software design, and even overall product integration and product testing. Most of our customers with our wireless products are in industries like medical, commercial, industrial, or higher-end consumer products. Applications where reliable, robust connectivity is an absolute must, and so they just can't compromise on quality and performance. It's also important to note here that from a silicon manufacturer perspective, we have aligned ourselves with NXP and we're one of their gold partners. We chose this at CEL because they have 
leading edge technology in the Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and 802.15.4 space. They also have a great variety of multi-protocol options for us to choose from when building our radio modules. They provide a lot of customer support in the driver development and software integration stages. And also because they make so many microcontrollers and microprocessors that are always required to integrate with the radios, it presents a single stop source for many of our customers to use a full NXP-based solution. Now, Brandon, what kind of factors should designers keep in mind when choosing a wireless solution? Sure. Well, first off, they should just know that when you're making a product that's wirelessly enabled, it's extremely complicated. There's many things to consider that maybe a previous generation product did not have to worry about. First is, what are you connecting to? Maybe you're embedding Wi-Fi into a product that's going to talk to an access point in the consumer's home or in a business or a commercial setting. Maybe your product is going to talk directly to a smart device that the user is going to own. Maybe it's going to talk to other end devices in like a mesh type network. Also, what's the environment in? What type of enclosure does the product go in? These things contribute significantly to the RF performance, and they've got to be known up front so that we can help customers design the best product for their application. Also, who's installing it? Is the end user supposed to be the one to configure and set up this device? Or is there a professional installer that will be doing the installation? What are the wireless standards that need to be compliant with and that the customers need to be aware of when they're building their products? What certifications are required? Do you need FCC certification? Other regulatory certifications in other countries? Also, just what does the development team consist of? There's RF expertise that's required. There's hardware development activities, software. You've got to test the product and the radios. You've got to build it in production. Also, investments in capital expense and operating expense. What's the equipment that you need? What are the people that you need? When we start talking about adding wireless connectivity to products, oftentimes it requires things that a manufacturing environment may not have building a product similar product without that wireless connectivity. And finally, consider time to market. CEL can deliver a working radio that's very easy to integrate into a product, whereas some customers go down the path of building this on their own, and they end up spending a lot of time, and it can delay when they launch their product into the market. That's a lot of things to consider. So what does CEL focus on to help customers obtain reliable connectivity? Yeah, so there's really five key areas that we look at. The first is picking the right radio. Second, how do we integrate that radio into our customer's product? Third, how do we help the customer test their product and get the performance that they want? The fourth is let's compare the performance of the radio in their product to what we know our radios can achieve on their own. And then the fifth is putting the customer product in its working environment and doing actual field testing so that we and our customers can be confident when those products are shipped out into the field, they'll work as designed. That makes sense. Now, talk to me about what we should be looking for in a radio. So for any of the radios that we're picking for new products, first, we're looking at transmit power. So how much power can the radio transmit out of the silicon that comes from, in this case, NXP? We want maximum transmit power because that's key to getting a robust communication link. Second, we want to look at the receive sensitivity. So if we think of the transmit power as how loud the radio can shout, the receive sensitivity is going to be how well can it listen when other radios are talking. We want that as high as possible so that we get the best performance we can receive the data coming from the other side of the radio link. Third is going to be radiated power. So this is where CEL really excels. Radiated power is how much of the transmit power out of the silicon can we take and convert into radiated energy through our RF network and the antenna that we provide on our radio. A poorly designed radio will be very inefficient, whereas a well-designed radio and optimized antenna will be very, very efficient. Oftentimes, that's the difference in a reliable link and a link that just doesn't communicate. The fourth is the antenna performance. So in addition to being highly efficient, we want it to be omnidirectional. Most IoT products the orientation of the product when it's being used is not known relative to the other end of the communicating device. So in that case, you've got to have an omnidirectional antenna radiation pattern so that the customer can get good performance regardless of how the product itself is oriented. 
Next, we're looking at noise rejection. So how well is our radio receiver designed to reject and eliminate noise that's gonna be out there because there's so many other radiating devices in play these days. Finally, we're looking at EVM, error vector magnitude. This has to do with not only how well the radio itself performs, but the crystals that we integrate, how stable are they over temperature and over other fluctuations in input voltage or battery voltage. This is gonna help us get more reliable transmission, fewer retries, which fewer retries leads to higher data throughput, lower power consumption, and improved latency, all things that are important when you're talking about IoT devices. So how does CEL in particular help customers with integration? Yeah, so we take a very hands-on approach when we work with a customer. We like to be highly involved. And the things that we do are things like, first, look at the mechanical design of their product. If we can see a mechanical concept, then we can help the customer understand where's the best place to put the radio so the antenna will have maximum performance. Without doing this up front, we've seen products where the antenna gets put in a poor location. And by the time we're working with a customer, it's too late to completely reconfigure the design. Next, we're looking at hardware integration. So that's the electrical hardware. How are we doing all the grounding? How are we routing other traces, maybe that don't connect to our radio, but that have an impact on the RF performance? So how does that board layout look to get the best performance out of the antenna that they can possibly get. Third is just where is the antenna inside the product? Whether it's an antenna integrated into our radio or an external antenna, where does it need to be to give you the best chance of successful communication? We'll do schematic reviews for customers, just looking at how everything is configured. These are very complex radios. There's a lot of different things going on. So it always helps to get extra sets of eyes on things before they've been fabricated and can't no longer be easily changed. And then lastly, we'll do simulation testing. So we can look at a customer's design and we can run simulations to show them the performance that we expect. And that way, before they build products, they have an idea of, of what they should get when they put those products out in the field. So let's talk about testing in particular. What kind of product testing does CEL perform? Sure. So the primary testing we use is looking at total radiated power or TRP testing. We have this great look at anechoic chamber in our engineering lab. And what we do is we can measure the received power at various angles, rotating the antenna in two different axes. And then we can plot that data. And so that essentially gives us the radiation pattern. And we can see how uniform is that pattern. And we can look at the total power and see how efficient is the antenna design. That lets us see what percentage of the conducted power that we talked about earlier is actually transferred into RF power to come out the antenna and radiate to the other side. As we look at the TRP plot that is generated, you see this 3D plot with the different colors. This lets us see the contrast in what's the uniformity of that field and what's the strength of that field. And those things are both very important. We start and look at this at the radio level that we design and then we can get similar data for customer products and make sure that it's the same. We also do simulation testing. So we have our TRP testing as a baseline, but we can work with a customer. We can get a 3D model of their product and we can do simulations on that and we can generate similar plots and see what's the TRP data going to look like if they keep the design as is. In this case, you can see an application where we worked with a customer and we identified four locations they could place the radio antenna. And we were able to simulate all four of those and see which one gave the best performance. And that was the location they moved forward with. So had they not been working with a partner that could put this level of expertise and effort in on the front of the design, they could have gone to market with the radio in the wrong location for optimal performance. So once you have this TRP and simulated data, Brandon, how do you use it to optimize wireless performance? Sure. So we're looking at first the TRP data for just the radio module itself. And because we've simulated that and gathered the actual lab data, that will validate our simulation model. So now we've validated our simulation model. Now we can simulate the customer product and then we'll gather TRP data on the end customer product. So we can actually bring their product into our lab, into our anechoic chamber. We can gather the same data on their product and we can look for differences. Oftentimes it's things like the materials used in the enclosure, 
It could be the batteries or other metal objects that are a part of the product that are going to have an impact on the radiation pattern. But now we can gather that data and see how is it performing? Has there been a significant impact? If you look at these graphs here, you'll notice that there is what we call a null spot. So there's one location, and this was before they changed their design. There's one kind of direction where the radiated power almost went to zero. That was causing this customer some problems. So by working with CEL and our engineering team, we were able to move the radio in their product and essentially eliminate that design trade-off. Excellent. So what about field testing? What have you guys done in this realm? Sure. So field testing is where it gets fun. This is where we get the engineers out of the lab and we get to get creative and go into real world environments and see how the radios perform. What we'll do is we'll take the radios and put them in either the enclosure the customer uses or something that's very similar. And we'll run what we call an iPerf testing. Uh, iPerf is just a measure of network performance. It measures throughput between two devices, wired or wireless, to give you an idea of how robust or reliable is the connection between those two. We'll put it in the environment where the product's gonna be used. Uh, this is very important. If you're gonna be used in an environment that is harsh, either from a electromagnetic noise perspective or a lot of metal objects between the two radios, temperature extremes, things like that, you've gotta run tests in those environments to get a good idea of how the radios will perform. So we'll go into that environment. We'll run this iPerf test to get a measure of the health of the wireless connectivity. And then the higher the throughput, the healthier the network, the more data we can send, the more reliable it is. So in this case, we had a customer who was making a kind of a smart trailer. They were gathering some diagnostic data on this tractor trailer rig. And they had a transmitter located in the rear axle of the trailer that needed to talk to a receiver in the cab. And with what they were doing, it just simply wasn't a reliable connection. And they came to us and needed some help. So the first thing we did, we were looking at our CMP9010 radio. This is a Wi-Fi 4 plus Bluetooth solution based on a chip from NXP, their IW416 chip. And it's got an integrated PCB trace antenna designed by CEL. It carries all the certifications. Software has all been done. So the customer can easily integrate this into their solution. So what we did is we took this radio on our evaluation board and we integrated that with NXP's IMX RT1060 EVK, the eval board for this processor. And essentially that was the platform the customer was looking to use. We made a wireless connection over Wi-Fi between our module and a Linksys router connected to a laptop, which for the purposes of this test was serving as the server. And then we just started running our iPerf testing. So this is giving us essentially a baseline number of how much throughput can we get just with our radio on that processor talking to this router or this access point. Uh, we did a couple trials, both at 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz, just to make sure the numbers were consistent. You can see here we got around 31 megabits per second at 2.4 gigahertz in the 5 gigahertz band, a little more throughput, so we were averaging 38 megabits per second. For a lot of IoT applications, this is way more data than they actually need. Even in the case of our customer application here, this is way more than they needed. That's great. This is just the baseline. So this was in an ideal environment, kind of sitting you know, in an office not too far apart on the radios. So then the next step in gathering this real-life data, we took them 50 feet apart. So this is roughly the distance of the customer application, but still not in the harsh environment of their tractor trailer more in like an office setting. So going through a few walls, what we can see here is in the 2.4 gigahertz band, we were still running about 90% of the throughput from our baseline test. In the higher frequency five gigahertz band, we were at about two thirds of the baseline. So important thing to note there, this is not unique to our radio. Physics being what it is, the higher frequency is gonna be more impacted by the increased range. But still two thirds of the throughput, plenty of bandwidth, for all kinds of IoT applications. So with this data, we could talk to the customer and say, look, we know that we can deliver the throughput you need, but we need to go test it in your environment. So that's where it got fun for the field testing. We took our radio connected to the NXP eval kit and we mounted it inside an enclosure and actually secured it to the rear axle of a tractor trailer that was sitting in the parking lot of an adjacent building to our engineering office. We parked a cab in front and that's where we put the laptop connected to the access point. Then we were able to go through and run the same iPerf testing 
that we had done before and see what kind of throughput could we get in this environment with our antenna and our optimized radio. So keep in mind, the customer had already done a design with a Wi-Fi radio using some commercially available antenna implementations, whether it's a chip antenna or a PCB trace antenna design they found online, and they couldn't get connectivity at all. So when we set this up uh, and ran this test with our radio, 2.4 gigahertz, we got 4.7 megabits per second, almost five megabits per second. And at the higher five gigahertz frequency, we were up close to 15 megabits per second. So this, after the customer using the same Wi-Fi technology, couldn't even make a reliable connection. We're delivering fairly significant throughput. So the customer, of course, was very pleased with these results. They had pursued things like external antennas, which are very expensive and can be broken and then require installation costs and things like that. Our solution eliminated all of that for them, gave them a reliable connection, and it really solved the problem in just being the difference between a connection that works versus a connection that doesn't work. That's great. Now, Brandon, you focused on five key areas that help improve wireless reliability. So by focusing on these, how else does it deliver value to your customers? So from a technical perspective, customers really appreciate the improved wireless performance. There's no doubt about that. This can do things like lower power consumption, give them more data throughput, reduce latency in a system that needs latency. If you're retrying multiple times to get that data through, it just takes longer. Maintaining connections. If you're doing firmware updates over the air, those get done faster with better power consumption. The overall thermals or thermal characteristics of the end product are much improved. Battery life is even impacted because of a more reliable, consistent wireless connection. But in terms of the upfront work from the radio integration, design reviews, and things like that, it reduces some of the mistakes that customers could make in the development cycle that could either require multiple circuit board spins, which add cost and delay schedules. It speeds up time to market. The fact that we're working with them from the very beginning we know what problems to look out for and we can help customers avoid those. That way they can get their product to market faster. For many of our customers, they actually feel like the CEL engineering team becomes part of their own R&D team. And we bring our support and our expertise along with our engineers. So that reduces their overall risk. Development time just decreases because they let us be the radio experts and we let our customers focus on what they do best. And then when a product performs well, expenses in terms of supporting and servicing products go down. It makes it more profitable. It really has a ripple effect on where the benefits show up when the wireless connectivity piece of an IoT product just works well. And most of all, it just helps companies be confident, not only in their product, but in the supplier behind that radio as they launch you know, a wireless product to market. That makes sense. Now, it seems like your high-performance NXP-based lineup of modules and technical support, designers should be able to get started immediately. Absolutely. Customers can reach out to us directly. You know, the thing is, every customer application is a little unique with slightly different requirements. Everyone's got their own set of unique challenges, but we've done so much in the radio space. We can quickly identify a plan to support the customer, get them in the best product and the best radio, and most of all, give them a highly reliable solution. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Brandon. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in to CEL's Chalk Talk on Achieving Reliable Wireless for IoT. Highlighted here are several ways to reach CEL directly. Please contact them to discuss your specific needs and projects. Thanks again for joining me, Brandon. Thank you so much for having me. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from CEL. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. If you can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.